Good evening, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jenny Evans. I'm the Adult Education Director here at SCCF, so thank you for joining us tonight. Um, a couple of quick things since we are on Zoom so that you all can be aware. This is set up as a webinar, so uh, we cannot see you, and hopefully you can see us, but we cannot see you. So if you are making dinner or talking to your friends and neighbors or whatever it is, we cannot see you or hear you, so don't worry about that. Um, we will be taking questions, and if you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be a button that says Q&A. Looks like a little word bubble. If you click on that, you can type in any questions that you have for us throughout the presentation. We will be monitoring that for answering your questions at the end of the program. Um, there is also a chat feature, I believe. You are welcome to type in that, but we won't be monitoring that nearly as, uh, as much as we will for the Q&A section. Um, so <clears throat> a couple of words about what we what we've got going on tonight. Um, we've got two short presentations, and then we've left a lot of time at the end to hopefully answer some of the questions that you may have um, concerning both architecture and landscape. So there's gonna be a presentation for myself, and there's gonna be a presentation from Elle, and then we're gonna open it up for some conversation back and forth. So feel free to let us know what your burning questions are, and we will try to get to them as much as possible. Um, so without further ado, I want to welcome our guest, um, Elle, uh, Elle Gerdman. She is a fabulous person on top of, of being a principal architect at Coburn Gerdman Architecture and also a design critic at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, so Elle is gonna take it away and um, like to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so first of all, um, thank you so much, Jenny, for the introduction and for SCCF for inviting me to participate in the series and in this panel. Um, my hope today is to talk about the sand cap style or the Sanibel Captiva style and um, try to unpack or discover what exactly that is um, for the islands. And this has really come about, this whole talk really came about in working with SCCF, we are working on the rebuilding of their intern housing project um, on Sanibel. And so these are some very, very early schematic um, images that we had created as a part of this project, but it started to um, help us to create a deep dive into what exactly is Sanibel and Captiva. Um, as a style and as a sort of architectural performance, um, which we'll all talk about. A little bit of background about me. Um, I have a small practice in Boston called Koji, and we design projects which are um, somehow familiar, a little bit unusual, um, but are all taking into account what the um, natural environment is or what the sort of local aesthetic, local characteristics or vernacular. So the style of the place or the building of the place. Um, most of these are in um, the north. So we saw a kind of a beach house on a barrier, another barrier island, but off of Boston, um, looking at handcraft within um, Columbus, Ohio, and then some various other projects in New England. Um, but what brought me to this presentation is really my um, history with Sanibel and Captiva. Um, so I, I have a long history with the islands. Um, even my father was an architect in Sanibel in the 1970s. He lived there. Um, and then since moving back to Ohio, he's been continuing to come back every year. And then, of course, when I was born in the 80s, I came every single year. So it's it's been a sort of long running um, part of, of my life. And I have a huge emotional vested interest in um, how this island is um, going to rebuild and how we can kind of retain the uh, incredible character of the island. Um, and so in, in doing this presentation, we're really trying to figure out what is um, the essence of place of Sanibel and Captiva. There's clearly something there which, um, is is totally loved, which I, it just emanates um, every time that you're there. Um, and this is something that no hurricane can destroy. So there's this beauty of the islands. There's a natural landscape that's so much a part of um, of the the essence. There's uh, the biodiversity, of course, um, shepherded by conservation groups like SCCF, um, and 
And what we see in all of the photos, every photo that I look through of my own and, and even online, there's just a minimal human touch. So, so much of it is um, the landscape and the ecosystem here and just, you know, just a little um, boardwalk here, a road here, but even in this, which we know, I mean, especially now post Ian, there are many buildings back here, but we don't see them because actually we're allowing for the landscape to be um, front and center. Um, and, and that's something that's so, so important in, in the place. Even this kind of um, older photo we see as sort of peppering of buildings, but a lot of landscape. And in a more recent image, something very similar, a peppering of building and a lot of landscape. So the siting of these buildings is really important. Um, when you're looking through historic photos, you even still see this obscuring of the building itself because the landscape is so present. Um, this is King's Crown back when I was kind of starting to, to come to Captiva and we see um, just a little bit of landscape, or sorry, a lot of landscape and just that peek, peek through of the building itself. But when you do see the buildings, you start to see a lot of character and a lot of uniqueness. This is the um, little gingerbread house um, on Captiva, a lot of detail, um, certain ornamental features we'll talk about. We see on Sanibel, um, the Anchor Inn, how we have a very articulated um, roof and materiality. Um, and, and so I think for, for this talk, again, we're trying to understand how we can assist um, or to really think uh, intelligently about the rebuilding effort so we can continue to allow that, that like, essence of the place of Sanibel and Captiva to come through. Um, so I'll talk about this in four categories, in siting and building and shape and material and in detail. Hopefully this gives you a little bit of a toolkit um, for yourselves as you look at moving forward and building. Um, so in, in siting the building, um, we talked about how there's a sort of landscape forward um, approach. And this was already a part of the Sanibel plan. And many of you are probably very well aware of the Sanibel plan. But um, for those of you who aren't, it's this um, really amazing example of zoning and building code um, within America. This is something we really look up to, and I'm a huge fan of it. Um, but it talks about the ability for buildings and, and the built environment and um, code to support conservation, to support the sort of natural systems through a series of um, different methods. And we'll talk about a few of those. Everything in this um, presentation kind of supports the Sanibel plan. But here we're seeing how the natural conditions are really a part of it. And this was an image that um, James from the SECF shared in the last panel, which is amazing to kind of see what Sanibel could have been should something like the Sanibel plan not have been implemented. So why is that and, and where is all of this coming from? Uh, again, I know many of you are very um, knowledgeable about the history, but it's interesting to know where the, the siting and the building design had kind of come from. Um, so of course the Calusa Indian um, tribe was uh, around in this area. We know the constructed shell mounds um, that are throughout. And um, following this, kind of the key points here, the island opened for homesteading in um, 1888, which started to bring in um, a larger population of people there was a schoolhouse, there's the, um, the lighthouse, which was open in 1884. Um, then this quickly started to create farming of pineapple, watermelon, pumpkins, key lime, um, which many of the key lime trees are existing, sugarcane, and tomato farming. Um, what's interesting about this is in 1926, there was a hurricane that actually changed um, some of the the methodologies for how people are coming in. And instead of being farming, it actually became unsuitable and became uh, tourism. So there's a history of um, how hurricanes are affecting the way we use the island as well. Um, we all know that there's a huge uh, population of artists that have come through here, such as Ding Darling and other very famous um, guests, Roosevelt, et cetera. This was Ding Darling's cottage on Captiva, and now it's um, 
being used as the Rauschenberg residency, which is a very famous artist residency in the United States. Um, so some interesting ways of thinking about the sighting of Sanibel and Captiva. And what about the building and shape, the grammar, the kind of building grammar for the area? So much of this is stemming from the Cracker House. So we, we think about Cracker architecture, which is about the kind of farming architecture of the area. And this is really, really humble in its origins, mostly because it was difficult to get materials on the island. It was pre-Causeway, and so everything was being constructed here using mostly native and local um, uh, materials such as slash pine and even um, uh, a thatch, as in the bottom right. But what is interesting about the um, cracker style house is that it already is utilizing hip roofs to reflect heat um, and windstorms, which we'll get to. There's raised floors, which we all know, um, and shotgun hallways for ventilation. So we'll talk about that. But I think when, one thing to um, get to is that many of the architectural features that we see in the islands right now is um, in some way tied to an idea of a climate sensitive uh, way of building and is it's all very smart and we should be kind of thinking about that as we continue to build and, and think about ways to reduce our carbon footprint on the islands. Um, so again, the Sanibel plan talks about this. How do we use natural ventilation and, and even recycled materials and all of these things to create um, smart, sensitive buildings? Um, so let's quickly talk about the building shape. I'm using the Sanibel Lighthouse quite a bit in this presentation because it was a great example of um, an architecture that works well in this climate. So we see that it's a relatively regular shape. These are almost squares. They have a hip roof, which looks kind of like a diamond um, rather than a, a gable, which is kind of like an A-frame. Um, and what this does, many of you know, is it starts to allow for wind to come up and over the, the building. The square allows for or relatively regular geometry that doesn't have a lot of inlets and outlets, innies and outies in the geometry, allows for wind to kind of make it around um, more easily. This little chimney, also helps, um, we'll talk about ventilation, but it helps with the positive and negative pressures that build during a high intent or high wind event. So that also is something that is beneficial. You can kind of see a diagram here of how that's operating. The shotgun um, plan. So this is a part of the cracker style building, which we had seen and you've seen a lot of on the islands. But what's remarkable about this is the ways in which it uses natural ventilation um, for the hot, humid climate. So you all probably know about cross ventilation, open a window on one side of the building, open a window on the other side of the building, it allows air to rush through and creates a draft, cools the building down. This floor plan is incredible because it is doing that just based on the organization of the building. So we see this um, hallway right in the middle of the building. And if you imagine that both sets of doors are open, it's going to allow for the breeze to go and right through. And it mean, because it's right in the middle of the building, it kind of cools the whole building down. There aren't these hot spots right in the middle. Another smart thing that these plans are doing is you can see these two chimneys. Those are those like H-shaped um, features right here and here. And the chimney allows for, because heat wants to rise, it allows for the heat to kind of collect and move up the chimney and therefore cools down the building. So a simple diagram here you can see is the cross ventilation coming across. That's very simple. And what we call the stack effect. So the the air being able to come up and out of the building at the top. Sometimes this is also called the chimney effect. Um, but that is moving up through the chimneys here in these cross sections. Um, alternatively, there's the re redistribution, um, which is a little different, and that also can include more similarly to air conditioning. But so these are super simple principles, and they can help a lot with um, allowing for uh, cooling principles when it's not super, super hot. Like you're probably going to have a different system if it gets up into the 90s, but um, for, for temperatures, most a good part of the year, those natural ventilation systems can help a lot. 
this is an image of the interior of that cracker house. So if you can imagine behind me or behind the camera, um, there's another door and that's where the air just rushes through the middle of the building. This is the lighthouse. Again, you can see um, how the chimneys are right in the middle, maybe to draw heat up and out. This also happens in these clear stories. So we see these all over. This is the island store in Captiva. And those little clear story windows um, usually historically would be able to open up and allow for the heat to rise up through the building and out. Um, some more examples, the Bailey Homestead, another similar home on the left, the so Bailey on the right, the heat can leave through the top. Some more clear story um, views. Sometimes this is ornamental now um, for light, but uh, you can imagine these as being operable. It looks like these windows over here are operable to let heat out on. Um, on warmer days. And this is a beautiful example by Charles Moore on Captiva built in 1971 and beautifully renovated by Joyce Owens. Um, but you can see how this, this like principle doesn't have to always look the same. It can be contemporary, uh, contemporary and still allow for the heat um, to come out and even light to come down through the skylight. This is an example of a, um, a solar house, but it's using that the chimney effect or the stack effect by having these um, solar chimneys right in the middle that allow for the heat to come up and out. Um, so, so the roof, what does that mean for the roof? Well, materially, we know that um, a metal roof, it's working very well for hurricanes. It also helps to deflect heat and sunlight. Um, we are seeing the hip roof style a lot. We've talked about that. This is the gable style roof, which also allows for the deep overhangs like we're seeing here. Um, and for water to shed. These are the tween waters in cottages um, that are some great examples of hip roofs and the overhangs um, to allow for self-shading. Here's an example of the, um, the gable, so not quite a hip roof again, um, but this is all over the island as well. Um, it's starting to show a style, it's historical 1924, um, but is a great example too of the metal roof. This example is really interesting um, because it is, it's one of the historic homes, Shorehaven, that you can find on Santa Bell, but it's also a Sears Roebuck kit home, which meant you pick it out of the catalog, you ship it to a location, and then you build it. It's kind of like prefab now. Um, but what I like to see is that the original image, what you would see in the catalog looked like this, something very New England. You'd find it where I am right now up um, in Cambridge. Um, uh, in Boston, but this is how they actually appropriated it and made it a little bit different to work with the Sanibel Captiva aesthetic. Um, so we can see the differences there. Again, the deep overhangs really allow for self-shading and cooling of the building. Um, we're seeing different examples of how that could happen. You can think of the sun orientation and how to allow for self-shading to be very effective and also decorative. We um, sometimes see these rafter tails. We'll see some more examples of that. That's those little white um, rafters that are peeking out um, as a detail. The, the roof can also extend out and we can we see examples of how these cottages have porches on either sides because of the roof. And we can even think a little bit um, uh, creatively about the shaping of the hip roofs and um, roofs that are good for wind events um, and shedding water. Like these are, um, I, I love the old image of this dock at the end of Andy Ross Lane from the 20s, that um, tourist dock, but we see that slight little bit of curve in there. It does a lot architecturally, but it's still operating in a very similar way. Again, we see the rafter tails, we see a little bit of ornament and, um, and also functionality in the way that these columns are picking up the roof. We There was a similar dock like this in Yusepa that has, it's a little hard to see in this photo, but that ever so slight curvature on the roof. Um, so a lot that you can do really with the shape of the building to work on resilience um, and to start to get it into that, uh, what we think of as the sand, sand cap style. Material, well, material the palette of Sanibel obviously is, is quite light and bright and airy. But now we have to also think about um, resilience with, with 
in um, wind events and, and hurricane events, um, as well as uh, what does it mean to have maintenance and for these materials to be able to withstand and last a long time? Um, you've probably heard of fiber cement. Maybe James Hardy is, is one of the brand examples, but um, if you are to use something like that, I recommend a board and batten. There's the lap plank, there's shingles, even these little half round scalloped shingles are found throughout the island as well as stucco. And we can talk about how to make these more environmentally conscious um, pretty soon. But I wanted to show you an example. Again, this is King's Crown with the board and batten. Here, it, it feels very um, sand cap in a lot of ways. Um, but how do you start to ch uh, choose these materials and think about what they mean for our environment or the environment of the kind of ecological important ecological zone that um, Sanibel and Captiva are. And so I'll give you some things that you can kind of keep in mind. Um, there are, in the same way that you might think of buying organic food um, to put in your body to reduce the chemical load on your body, you can think of that as um, in building materials as well. And so there are certain guides that help you understand where the chemicals are and how to avoid them. Um, this is the Living Building Challenge Red List of chemicals, and it's it's pretty easy to just go online and see what these materials are or what these chemicals are and how to avoid certain ones. But you can see there are certain chemicals that are found in paints and sealants and wood preservatives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but just kind of inform yourself on when you're choosing certain materials, are do they have a kind of chemical component that you could avoid? And they also make um, a really nice database of materials that are healthy, or termed healthy, like this is um, the De Declare database and you can just type in any type of material. I just put in tile here and we have all of these um, healthy tiles that you could use as an, an example. There are also like uh, lumber and actual building materials in there as well. Another thing to consider if you are um, starting to imagine construction is the carbon footprint for building materials. Um, you might not even think about it uh, until these days, but there is a carbon footprint for materials and it's kind of complicated, but it, it doesn't really have to be. So you just have to think about um, the whole life cycle of a product. So what does it mean? What is the carbon um, count for when it's being produced, the fabrication of it, the construction of it at your site, the maintenance and use of it, how much does it take to really maintain that material? And then what is the end of life? Does it get recycled? Is it um, something that goes into a landfill? Um, and so that whole spread really is part of um, how you determine how carbon intensive a material is. Um, you can, if you don't know, you can just look up and see how good or bad a material is. I've highlighted here just simply some of the materials we talked about, like aluminum siding or roofing um, versus fiber cement, party board, and stucco. And um, aluminum roofing can be really great if it's recycled. It's terrible, one of the worst materials possible if it's not recycled. So that kind of leads us into thinking about how can we choose um, materials that we know are great for the hurricane resilience and construction and affordability on Sanibel and Captiva, but also think about how they are also good for an, an, our environment. So we know that we probably need to use concrete blocks. So can you think of a concrete block that has less cement? Cement is also a very carbon intensive material with a lot of additives. There are great, super um, structurally robust Con or cement or sorry concrete blocks that um, are low in cement great for the environment recycled aluminum roof other types of insulation these things are actually pretty easy to find now they're very available the price point is getting much more comparable to a, a typical material from um, whatever building supplier um, so I definitely encourage you to think about that another surface I'd like to sort of bring up is the ground surface. And I think Jenny might touch on this a little bit, but how can you think of preserving the existing site? Maybe not going out through and bulldozing everything, but if there are key, um, I don't know, plant material um, 
or features on your site? Can you create your building design or even your landscape design around that? Working with your builder and with your landscape architect or architect or yourself, just identify what you want to miss and allow for it to retain. You can also think about pervious or permeable paving. It's easy to do this instead of um, asphalt. Asphalt prevents water from getting down into the earth. Pervious paving allows for water to sleep, um, uh, sneak through the cracks and get back down into the earth. This is can be uh, really, really helpful for building design. Um, there's even crushed shell here. And if you want to think about um, mitigating your water use, one really easy and efficient, very, very efficient thing to do is just specify dual flush toilets. It saves a lot of water and um, is just one simple different um, product. I definitely encourage you to look at the incentive guide by SCCF. You can find this on their website, but there are so many um, monetary incentives that um, can really add up and help you make uh, good choices on the materials um, in a kind of ecological way. All right, and that's specific for your area too. Detail, so some of the fun things here. We can, you know, in the Sanibel plan, it categorizes um, the Sanibel Captiva style as old Florida style, island eclectic. I'd like to throw in Florida gingerbread in there too. Um, but there are so many examples of some of the quirky elements. So the, the quirky details of Sanibel, like these triangular windows, this lattice on the um, handrail, all of these X handrails that um, used to be found. This one was on South Seas Plantation. Um, the, the gingerbread here on Captiva, like I had mentioned um, previously, even the Thistle Lodge at Casa Ebel has all of this little gingerbread ornament in the patios. Interesting to see that um, historically. I had mentioned those scalloped shingles. You can see some of those up here in the turquoise and some really um, kind of artsy handrails over here on the left. Um, in Sanibel, we have the Florida gingerbread here on the Gasparilla Inn at Boca Grande. Um, and then the, the big, beautiful scalloped um, patios on uh, Yusepa at Collier. And again, um, these, these details that are both climate um, friendly and also uh, uh, enhancing the aesthetic of the island, something that we all kind of see down there are these louvers. This is of Captiva, a little drawing of Captiva, Land's End at Captiva, where you have these um, shutters, which are not for storm resilience at all, but instead help to reduce the solar gain um, within the building. So it cools the building. This is a great, really funky example um, by Paul Rudolph, very famous uh, modernist architect um, who did the Walker Guest House in 1953 and had this really fun take on how to create louvers that operate up and down um, on the building. So you could totally close the building up or open it up all the way. Um, another version of louvers, this is um, in Miami, but um, creates, takes the louver and puts it fully at the building scale. So it becomes really ornamental, but also very functional at the same time. Um, a great example. Another thing I encourage you to think about is the design of the foundation. Since everything is going to be lifted um, that hasn't already, then it's it's interesting to think about what is the design of that and how has that become architectural, an architectural feature. And I just wanted to show this um, Yusepa Island, the, the entry dock, which you come in on, and all of that um, scalloped articulation on that, maybe as a reference to think about for how we could start to detail um, the underside of these buildings. Um, that, that shape is so prominent. It's in their logo. It's in this other little um dock entry and and so how do we do that for um for our newer buildings within Sanibel and Captiva all right so that was pretty long-winded um I'm leaving a, uh, this kind of index slide here for you thinking about siting how do we nestle the buildings within the landscape pay attention to scale so the the buildings aren't overwhelming the landscape but are kind of nestled in there um, the building itself, thinking about the history, thinking about um, what is the place and that term, the essence of place. Um, how do you think about the 
resilient and sustainable principles, the natural ventilation, um, through these details like the clear story, which seems very beloved um, in Sanibel and Captiva, those are actually operational and um, can come into the design. The material, can you think about materials that don't pollute the environment, but are also very resilient um, in hurricanes and also a, a, a work with this light and bright um, muted palette of Sanibel and Captiva. And lastly, the details. There's clearly a humble eclecticism in Sanibel and Captiva. And how do we really take part in that and thinking about it in, in the future? Um, I'll leave you with a few images from our project with um, SCCF for their intern housing, specifically on the principles that we're talking about. So this long um, uh, ventilation corridor that happens within the building, you can see them a couple here, um, and quirky elements that really try to bring in the landscape and even obscure it a little bit um, as you walk around and through the buildings. Um, so that's it. Um, I, I know we're going to do question and answer at the end, which I'm really looking forward to. If you want to ask more questions, there's so much stuff that I couldn't get into this, feel free to reach out. I'd love to chat with anyone about Sanibel and Captiva. All right. Thank you so much. All righty. <laughs> Thank you, Elle. Um, so we're just going to dive right into the other the other part of this, um, I'm going to share my screen and start to talk a little bit about landscape and some of the same, um, some parallels that you'll see between uh, L's, the principles in L's uh, presentation and some in mine. Um, so let me get this going here. Okay. All right. So um, when we start to think about the landscape, um, I like to start thinking about what it is that makes Sanibel and Captiva special. Um, and, and I like to show this picture first because I think when anyone that lives on the island or that has come on the island, immediately when you get onto our islands, you understand that you are where you are. Um, and I would argue that this landscape does not necessarily uh, give that sense of place. And I, in full disclosure, this is not a Sanibel or Captiva landscape. This is something that I plucked off the internet, so I'm not picking on any one particular person. Um, but what this landscape is, is basically an amalgamation of a whole bunch of different uh, plants from all over the world. And really, this particular landscape does not give one a sense of place at all, because you could be basically in any subtropical area all around the entire world. Um, we have things from every continent in this picture, um, so none of which necessarily represent our islands. So instead, uh, what I would like you to think about are the things that do make Sanibel and Captiva special and what are the landscapes and what are the components of that landscape that make it our location and only our location. And so when you come onto the islands, how do you know that that's where you are? Um, the first one, we're gonna look at a couple of different habitats. The first one, this is a picture from our freshwater wetlands, um, some of our, our grass uh, swale areas. Of course, our mangrove ecosystems are another system that uh, remind you that you are in our area. And then of course our beach dunes. And once you start to combine all of these habitats and all of these ecosystems, uh, you realize that you are in Sanibel and Captiva and Southwest Florida and nowhere else in the world. So that's what really grounds us to this place. So in shifting gears a little bit, um, we're gonna talk about some of these natural systems and some of the reasons that these natural systems are as resilient as they are in the face of um, whether it's climate change or storms or um, even just our normal day-to-day -day weather. And so when you start to look across the island, <clears throat> excuse me, this picture on the top is a, is a cross section. If you were to cut right through the middle of the island, of course, out by the Gulf of Mexico, we have the beach. There is a small ridge um, out on the Gulf Beach area. Then we get uh, moving from left to right, we get to the interior wetland. Uh, there's a, what's called the Mid Island Ridge. And then as we get out towards Pine Island Sound and the Bay Side, we get into the mangroves um, and our Bay Beach Zone. And so we're going to talk again a little bit about the Gulf Beach, the wetlands, and the mangroves. Um, all of them have, all of these habitats have components that are very interrelated and, and do a lot of the same things um, for us from a natural system standpoint. So the first one is the capability to attenuate waves and slow down water. So we're going to look a little bit at waves, um, particularly on the mangrove side. 
I just wanted to show you this quick little video. This is a very generalized view. It's a wave tank in some museum somewhere. Um, it's artificial, but you get the sense of see those waves coming in. They hit a system of mangroves. And then on the backside, there's virtually no wave action whatsoever. In the same, um, same idea, this is again, a wave tank seen from the top. You can of course see that as those waves come in from the mangroves at the top, there's very little erosion. And at the, at the bottom, there is significant erosion as the gentleman's little toy trucks uh, start to wear away. But um, the basic premise is that our mangrove uh, systems are very good at helping to protect us against wave action. Now, whether that's wave action from a hurricane or whether that's wave action from daily activities of boats or um, a north, uh, you know, a, a cold front coming through. Um, it doesn't really matter. What it does is it protects our, our coastal zone. The same could be said, and I don't have fun videos to show you for this part, but the same could be said on our Gulf side, on our, our beach dunes. All of the vegetation and, and the ecosystem there help to protect our shorelines from erosion, um, from heavy wave action. And so they're both sides of our island are ringed and those habitats are doing um, doing a lot of work for us and helping to protect our island through some of these um, significant storm systems. Now, the other thing I mentioned that these systems help to slow down water. And what does that really mean? Well, when it's it's really easiest to think about when you think about the interior wetland. So it's helping to uh, slowing, uh, let's think about summer rains, as the summer rains come down, the water collects in our wetlands and it starts to slow things down so that we don't have nearly as um, great of an influx from some of our fertilizers, our herbicides, our pesticides, that in a very severe summer rainstorm might run off our landscape very quickly. So the, the wetlands um, are helping to keep those nutrients from flowing into our waterways. Um, both on the, the mangrove and the beach side, uh, they are also uh, protecting against erosion, so slowing down that water before it hits um, before it hits the landscape and can erode away some of our um, some of our land systems. And then, of course, it's recharging our aquifers and our groundwater. So, attenuating the waves and slowing down water, all three of these ecosystems are really uh, efficient at doing at doing those activities. Now, the other thing that these natural systems do is that they have um, diverse root structures to hold soil. So I mentioned erosion, but what is actually really going on there? Um, this picture on the right is actually a, a diagram from um, prairie plants, but the same thing can really be applied to any of our plants in, in almost any of our ecosystems. And the thing that's important to note here is that each different type of plant, each diverse species of plant, has a slightly different root structure that lends something different to stabilizing our soils. And so if you have, if you can imagine trees versus shrubs versus grasses versus wildflowers, all of those are going to intermix and interweave and they all have different um, coarseness and different textures. And what that's going to do is that is a much better system to hold soils than if you were to just have a monoculture of one thing. Um, I like this picture on the left. This is a picture that I took out on the beach in February, so post Ian. Um, it was a picture from uh, one of those review of ravines that are out on the beach that um, came from the storm surge. But the thing that I found really interesting is I was standing down in the bottom of this gully, which is about five feet deep, and these sea oats in this picture, you can see them going all the way down to the bottom of that gully. Um, in many cases, many of our native plants are having root systems that are many, many, many feet deep. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out in this particular uh, diagram on the right is if you look at the very far left hand side, that's actually um, the root system of some turf grass. And from both an erosion standpoint and a holding soils and a building soils kind of structural idea, um, you can see that there really isn't any comparison between those. Um, the other thing is, of course, these root structures are able to capture and hold water. So again, it's slowing down that water, it's trapping the water, it's getting bound up in our root structures. Um, not nearly the same as if you, uh, again, had, had turf grass that cannot nearly have that water holding capacity. So if we go back out to um, move away from our beaches and over to our mangroves and think about the root structures of our mangroves, of course, we all are very familiar with, with red mangroves and their amazing prop roots. Um, I really love this series of pictures. This was taken by um, 
Christy Anders, who is the education director for SCCF for a number of years, and she was able to take this um, time lapse series of photos from the same exact location after Hurricane Charlie. Um, you can see this this little uh, I think it's a red mangrove popping up right here, and then a slightly bigger what I think is a black mangrove in the back. That picture that that same plant is in all of these pictures. So the top left is 18 months post Charlie. The mangroves are looking pretty beat up. But one thing I want to point out, and probably what you're seeing in your own, uh, any mangroves that you have near you, is that they are looking, um, in many cases, they they could be dead. Um, in many cases, they're looking very tattered and very twisted. Um, but that root structure is still functioning the same way that it did prior to the storm. Those roots that are going down into the water are still holding the soils. And what it's going to allow it to do is that over time, so if you look at this five years post Charlie, you see a little bit more green. And what you're going to have is the mangroves that have made it are going to start to flush back out. Um, they are very, very slow growers, but they're going to start to flush back out. And then it's going to allow it to have new mangroves, the new little propagules are going to drop within those existing roots, and it's going to allow new ones to grow up. At the same time, those, um, those prop roots are still functioning for wave attenuation. They are still functioning for nursery grounds for many of our marine species, and they are still trapping sediments, even if they are on plants that are dead. So it's kind of a rejuvenation. It's gonna take some time. Um, and then of course this bottom picture, 10 years post Charlie, the mangroves in this case are starting to look pretty much back to normal. Um, so it is a system that is gonna be slow to recover, but many of the benefits that we have in this system are still present even after um, such a significant storm as we just had from Ian. Okay, so the other thing that I've kind of alluded to as we go through this is a little bit about diversity. Um, I mentioned diversity in roots, um, but the other thing that you get from having diverse species, whether you're in the beach zone, the mangrove zone, if you're on a ridge, it doesn't matter, um, diverse species adds value to um, supporting our wildlife. So most all of our native plants um, have some benefit for wildlife, whether it's cover, providing food, um, providing nesting grounds, but you also get a resilience to any pests and diseases. And so what you see in this picture um, on the left-hand side is a, um, many people have been asking us how to plant a buffer um, between themselves and their neighbors because all of a sudden we can see um, all of the buildings around us and all of every, uh, you know, we see lack of vegetation from the storm. Um, one of our mantras has been that you want to think about planting a diverse number of species because not only is it better to support wildlife, but it's going to be better if there is a pest or a disease that comes through. So on the left hand side, this is actually a picture from my own yard um, where there is a another neighbor's yard on the backhand side and there's probably 30 species just in that picture. Um, on the right hand side is a slightly more managed landscape at the Bailey Homestead, and this back section um, again was a buffer that we have um, blocking a parking lot. Um, so the more diversity that you can add, the more resilient your landscape is going to be, whether it's a buffer or somewhere else. And the reason I like to mention that um, I, I talked a little bit about pests and diseases, but there are some really stark examples of what has happened in the past when diversity has not been as great as it should have been. Of course, in the middle of the last century, um, probably many of you have heard of Dutch elm disease. Um, the elm tree was used as a street tree um, in, in solely in many cases on certain streets. So here's a picture on the left of um, only elms down this street in Winnipeg, Canada. And then of course, after Dutch elm disease came through, this is what um, they were left with. Um, many urban forestries, uh, many urban foresters have become a lot more um, cognizant of things like this. So we have a much more diverse urban forest in many cases. Um, but the same thing can be seen even on a, a more present scale, a closer to home kind of scale. A couple of years back, many of you may remember um, something that we dealt with called ficus whitefly. In many cases, there were um, areas where there was a fig, it was called a weeping fig, that was planted as a hedge around people's, private, uh, people's property for privacy. Lo and behold, we get a whitefly that comes through and kills off much of the hedges. Um, so you can see where diversity is a helpful, a helpful thing in your landscape. Um, a couple other recent examples that I wanted to mention, and and um, some of the reasons that they that these pests may be valuable in some cases. So this is an example of a plant called fiddlewood. Um, there is a leaf roller called the fiddlewood leaf roller. It's the caterpillar in the middle, 
And uh, maybe about 10 years ago, we started to see a lot of our fiddlewood plants um, look like this on the right. This brown thing is a fiddlewood that just has had all of the leaves basically chomped to pieces. And um, had I had a hedge of fiddlewood, I wouldn't have been very happy. But um, thankfully, we had, again, diversity in our landscape. There's fiddlewoods kind of dotted all over the place. And the one thing that I think we need to keep in mind, this fiddlewood leaf roller is actually a native insect. And after there was some hand-wringing and worrying about what was going to happen, um, it was realized that, one, it doesn't do any permanent damage. The plant comes back out with a new flush of leaves. And from an ecological perspective, um, UF even came out and said the larvae are probably a valuable food source, particularly when baby birds need it in the spring dry season. And so that's something that I think is worthy to keep in mind is that even if we do have pests in our landscape that are creating um, what might not be visually pleasing to us, they very well might be feeding something else or serving an important role in our um, ecosystem. And so the most recent one that I wanted to bring up because we've been getting a lot of questions about this is um, something called the Edwards wasp moth. Um, it is a, a native moth that we have seen most frequently because it has um, become overabundant for some reason. And we don't really know the reason behind that. Um, it's probably likely due to some impacts from the storm. It's possible that their predators got wiped out and so therefore they didn't have anything eating them. It's also possible that we're seeing more of them because um, they have less food because some of our strangler figs were wiped out. Um, so the Edwards wasp moth is a plant that, or is an insect that only feeds on figs. And in particular, it really likes our native strangler figs. And so many people had seen strangler figs after the storm that had started to leaf out. And then a week later, all of a sudden they have no leaves whatsoever. And what it was is um, these caterpillars were munching down on the leaves and eating them all to pieces and basically defoliated pretty much every tree on the island. Um, don't fret quite yet. Um, it is an added stressor on top of the hurricane stress that we've seen. However, um, the strangler fix tend to have a lot, a large store of energy reserves. It's a very big tree. They've got a lot of energy. Many of the ones around the island we have seen coming back. So, so um, we think it will come back into balance. That is the one really amazing thing in nature and that Sometimes things get a little bit out of whack and most of the time they tend to resolve themselves on their own. Um, and in the process, we're hoping that these um, caterpillars were food for some kind of bird. So with all of that said, I just wanted to make a reminder that many times some things that are not going well in our yard um, can often be looked at from an ecological standpoint as a good thing. So in the case of that caterpillar, perhaps that was the base of the food chain for some of our birds. Um, all of our plants in one way or another form the basis of our food chain, which are forming, of course, the things that we find um, really interesting about living on our islands. And again, get back to that sense of place. So I want to shift away a little bit from thinking about the different habitats that we have on the island and the different benefits that they provide to us and start to think about how can we take advantage of those natural systems and start to think about that in our own landscape. Um, Elle started to talk about this um, in terms of siting of buildings and, and um, being thoughtful about where we place our built structures in our natural environment or in our, in our landscape. And I really like this. Um, these two, uh, these are Google Earth images taken from the same elevation overhead. Um, I will say the left one is on Sanibel. The right one, I will not name where it is. Um, but one of the things that I think is really unique about this, <clears throat> and you don't see this in many places, is this idea that when you look at the house, when you look at really almost any house, you cannot really differentiate on um, in this particular image where the end of a person's yard is and where the beginning of, in this case, um, a, a, I think this is one of SCCF's preserves. So where is that boundary? Um, and it's starting to be blurred in Sanibel. And that is something that I think um, both Captiva and Sanibel do really well is there is not this idea that nature is out there and my yard is over here and nature is over there. Instead, it's all considered one big sanctuary, one big preserve. And I think from an ecological standpoint, we are much more successful in that model. Um, of course, on the right hand side, we start to see, you know, where from an ecological standpoint it is very difficult for whether it's animals or even plants or insects to get from one place to another because you don't have that blurring of nature and yard. So I think this is a really stark contrast here. 
Um, so, so what does all this mean for you? What does this mean when you're thinking about revegetating after the storm, when you're looking around your yard and trying to figure out what it is that you're going to do as you, as you replant and rebuild? Um, the more that you can embrace these natural systems and the benefits that these natural systems provide, the better off you will be. The more pollinators you will have, the less water you will use, the more benefits that you will reap based on those, those things that we talked about, whether it's slowing down the water, attenuating waves, whatever it is. So the more you can mimic a natural system or embrace the natural system that's right over your fence, the better off you will be. You also wanna think about preserving existing habitat and vegetation on your own property. Um, of course, Sanibel was forward thinking in, um, in that our landscape plan requires you to do this if you are building. However, you can think one step further and, and think about the siting, again, Elle talked about this a little bit, but the siting of your built structure around the landscape. So perhaps you can move something five feet and you will be able to maintain these lovely strangler figs in the background. Um, one thing I did want to mention is the idea of construction around root zones, particularly of mature trees, um, in that many people don't think about heavy equipment driving over top of the root zone of, of plants. And in some cases, it can be very detrimental to the tree to the point where it kind of makes this slow death that you won't see for several years. But the further away that you can keep any construction equipment from any large trees, the better off you will be. Because in this diagram, as you can see, the, the root zone of a tree often goes not only twice, this is actually probably only two times, but sometimes three times as wide as the crown of the tree. So just be aware of that as you're having um, the landscape worked on around your own property and, and try to preserve as much of it as you possibly can. We've talked a bit about diversity, but the more diversity you can include, the better off you will be. Um, and by that, I don't mean um, select one of every plant because <laughs> while that is diverse, that is probably not uh, a functioning, a working as a functioning ecosystem and probably not providing a lot of um, benefit for your creatures. But, you know, having several species, lots, you know, 20 plants of one species, 20 plants of another species, 10 plants of another species, um, starting to build that ecosystem in your yard will not only support the wildlife, but if there are any invasive uh, diseases or invasive pests, you will be more resilient to that kind of um, change. The other thing that helps is um, the more diversity that you can have and the more you can work with your landscape, the less of the inputs that you will need on your yard. And by inputs, I not only mean things like irrigation, um, and as an example, this landscape, this is a picture from the Bailey Homestead, um, all of our demonstration landscapes were designed without irrigation in mind. So the idea being that long-term, you do not need irrigation um, to have a beautiful landscape. But that also includes other things like whether it's herbicides or pesticides or herbicides, but even sometimes things like string trimmers. Maybe there are ways that you can get, um, you, you, I always like to say, maybe you can be more of a lazy gardener. So maybe there are some things that you can kind of back off a little bit and, and not have nearly as many inputs. From a wildlife perspective, you are gonna be in much better shape. Um, I like to show our, our friend, the gopher tortoise that hung out with us for a while at the homestead and enjoyed munching on all of our plants. Um, so the fewer inputs you can have in your own yard, the better you will be off, the better off you will be. So with that, um, I think Elle and I will resume having um, uh, some questions and answers. We are happy to answer any of the questions you, you might have. Um, if anyone wants advice on landscaping or plants or what's appropriate for your yard, you are more than welcome to visit us at our um, garden center at the Bailey Homestead Preserve. Currently, we are open Tuesday through Thursday, 10 to 3. And then, um, of course, if anyone has questions after the fact and would like to get in touch with myself or with Elle, um, here is our contact information, and um, you are welcome to do that as well. So with that, um, I think Elle is coming back to join me, and uh, I will open it up to questions. I Let's see. I don't know what we've got going on here. It's going to take me a minute. Um, but I did want to, maybe I'd start, Elle. Um, one of the questions that uh, that I was thinking of, um, are there any 
As people are thinking about rebuilding their homes and rehabilitating, are there any of the features that you mentioned or, or that you didn't mention that are easily incorporated retroactively into buildings that can achieve similar results or that can start to take a, what I'll call a modern building and make it more um, Santa Bell and Captiva-like? Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about this um, too. And so there are certain principles that I think are really helpful in terms of um, climate. Like we had talked about the stack effect and the ventilation going hot air moving up and getting out of the building. If you have, I mean, a roof that's a gable or a hip or really many different shapes, you can actually add a clear story onto it or add some sort of venting that goes up and moves um, heat out of the building. So that's one thing that you could do. Um, many of you are probably going to have to reclad your building or um, put on a new roof. I would definitely encourage you to think about materials that have a long life cycle, like fiber cement or hardy board or um, something like stucco, um, definitely a recycled aluminum roof would be something to consider instead of something like asphalt um, shingles. I think moving towards metal is, is probably appropriate. Um, so I, I think those would be some first things that you could think about. Um, something as simple as putting louvers onto your windows um, to help some of the sun shading is a, a great thing that you could also think about that has minimal intrusion into the building itself. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah. So um, there is a question from Becky. Let's see, many residents need to replant in the dune area. Can you give any information or thoughts on best practices for replanting the dunes? Um, sure, so there are a couple of considerations. Um, one is you need to know where your CCCL line is located. Um, the coastal construction control line, because that basically dictates what kind of permits you need and where. Um, the city can help you figure that out if you don't know. Um, there are resources online to, to um, understand where that goes, but that's the first, the first step because that will dictate um, sort of your requirements. But in a general sense, um, my, my, the other thing that <clears throat> excuse me, you need to think about is sort of the distance from the water. So there are different um, different zones in the dune, what we call the four dune, which is, of course, out closer to the Gulf of Mexico. And then if you imagine that cross section that we looked at, it comes up a little bit. It's not very, um, it's not very pronounced in our area, but it comes up to the height of the dune and then it goes back down again. And the back dune will have different species of plants than what grow on the four dune. So it partially depends on what areas you're revegetating and what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, but we can certainly provide you with a list of plants that would be appropriate. Um, if you want to either email me or stop by the garden center, we can provide that. Um, however, um, the other thing I would say is definitely uh, consider planting more than just sea oats. There are a lot of projects that I see that um, not necessarily on our islands, but I would say sort of across the Southeast as a general statement where there isn't a lot of consideration given for um, diversity. And as I mentioned that difference in kind of rooting types and um, different plants do different things. Certain plants capture sand better, certain plants take overwash better, certain plants um, you know, are better for providing seeds for birds as an example. Um, so, so consider diversity, make sure you're planting, you should be planting at least, I'd say six to 10 species, depending on where you are. But you're gonna have different different plants in the four, zone, four dune zone than the back dune zone, then even you know, as you get further away from the beach. So um, the, other, the one other thing I would say is um, consider doing it over the summer where you are um, taking advantage of our natural summer rains. That way you're not out there. You, all of the plants will be able to long-term take um, that area without any irrigation. But if you don't have to be out there with a hose getting them established because they need to be watered while they're established, um, then don't do that. You know, Rely on our rains during the summer. Okay. So Elle, let's go back to you. Yeah, um, there are a few architectural questions here. Um, Do you want me to maybe, read them to you or you? Um, I'll, I can kind of summarize them and yeah. 
Um, so there have been a, a couple questions about materials. Um, and for those materials that are um, natural materials, like wood materials, there's a question about wood on a staircase. Definitely, um, it, it depends greatly on the species of wood, what kinds of treatment that you need to do. So try and figure out what exactly what material that is, and then you can um, go from there in understanding if treating it um, is, is useful. Um, in terms of the question by Ty, um, when air temperature is 93 degrees, what can you do other than venting? Okay, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. In the height of summer, natural ventilation, you might, your own comfort preference might not be that natural ventilation is going to work well. Um, and at nighttime, it might work great and you might be able to reduce your cooling load by, um, by allowing for the natural air to go through. If you don't want it to be on the warmer side on the interiors, then I would think about some highly efficient um, cooling methods, um, uh, air conditioning, and think about sealing your envelope. So the, the walls, the roof, even the underside, since we're raising um, these buildings with uh, insulation at a value that will um, really help you retain the cool on the interior. So then it switches over to the system of how do you make sure that the cool air doesn't escape if you are artificially cooling the interior. So I think a building that has the ability to have natural ventilation when it's not super, super hot out, but then be able to be um, sealed enough with insulation that when it is really hot and you want to um, cool it, that you can do that and it's not going to take too much energy. Um, there was a question about wood fiber insulation. It's actually not necessarily um, wood fiber insulation, but it's, um, Oh, sorry, wood fiber insulate. I was thinking about the um, other materials we were talking about. So that is a great question about um, the flood situation. There are many different uh, brands of this and different particular products. So you want to go through and kind of see what the different aspects are um, for these other types of more um, eco-efficient materials. Okay, I think there are some now landscape-based questions. All right. Um, so someone says, what types of native grasses do better where water pools after a hard rain? Um, I'm assuming that that is um, a kind of area that not only after a hard rain, but also in the summer might sit with some water. Um, normally, normally, by meaning um, not after a very large storm surge with um, salt water coming over our landscape like Hurricane Ian, um, normally there are plenty of um, whether it's grasses or, or, you know, other kinds of flowering plants, or even in some cases, shrubs that will do well in areas where it's dry in the winter and wet in the summer. There's a whole host of plants that, that do well in that kind of situation. However, um, the thing that you want to be thoughtful about, I would say probably certainly this year and probably for the next couple of years, is that the salinity in our soils and the salinity in our freshwater wetlands is, is very high right now. Um, because what happened is, of course, we had our storm surge. Anywhere that was low that would normally pool water in the summertime sat with water, sat with salt water after the hurricane. And the salt sat there. And so the um, we think that the summer rains will help start to reduce some of that salinity but it may not be back to where I would say in normal years, um, it may not be back to what we consider um, our normal salinity this year. It may not even be next year. We really just don't know. So in the intervening time, you want to think about if you are trying to plant, let's say this summer, you wanna think about selecting species that do reasonably well in a somewhat salty environment, even though you're planting it in what normally would be a freshwater environment. Um, so there are a handful of things that I would suggest. Um, the first one is a plant called Spartina bakeri or sand cordgrass. It's done very well after the storm. Um, it's come back in so many places. Um, it takes fresh water. It takes um, brackish water. Um, there's a handful of other ones, but that would be where I would start with. Um, and if you would like some more species, feel free to come and see us. But do think about the salt over the next couple of years. Some of our most salt sensitive plants are not going to really be happy immediately. 
Um, and then the next question is, if we can't start re-landscaping until fall, how long can we expect it to take to look decent? Um, so I, there's a couple of things with this question um, that I would, I would say. One is, um, there's nothing saying you can't re-landscape until the fall. Um, however, as I mentioned from the previous question, you do wanna be thoughtful about the amount of salt in your soil. And so from a, from a species selection standpoint, you want, to, um, you want to really choose the species that are going to be as salt tolerant. And um, the good, a good place to start is that we published a um, planting guide after Ian. And the plants that are included in that planting guide are the plants that we saw that did pretty well post storm. So because they were around after the storm and because they've survived, you know, this period of time, I think we can safely say that they're salt tolerant enough to make it. So those I would I would safely say, you know, you can go ahead and plant whether it's the summer or the fall and wherever it is. Um, as far as looking decent, it depends on what you mean by that. Um, I most people at this point are really just sick of seeing kind of brown. Um, so the really quick and easy answer, even though it may not be your long-term answer, is to pick the areas of your yard that you see most frequently, you know, whether it's walking to your front door, walking to your car, whatever it is, and put in some very quick growing wildflowers. They're going to grow really fast, they're going to bloom really fast, and they're going to sort of, um, you know, make you happy immediately. So, um, the things that are woody that are going to, you know, the plants that are going to, um, block the road from your house or block your neighbor from your house. Those are going to take a while. They that's just the nature of of kind of the way plants grow. It's going to be a couple of years. So I would suggest um finding some, you know, finding some ground covers, finding some wildflowers that are going to cover up some of the brown um while you're waiting for some of the other plants to fill back in. Okay. Um, so we have another one, another one about landscape um, that somebody asks, the foliage on buttonwood trees seems to have come back spectacularly well. Why is that? Was there something in the surge debris that acted as a natural fertilizer? Um, no, I don't think there was anything in the surge debris that was a natural fertilizer. Um, the buttonwoods um, in areas that they didn't just flat out either fall over or sit in salt water, um, buttonwoods are really, really tough plants. Um, they're very fast growing. And that's something else that um, particularly the person that asked the last question, um, but that I think is worthy of thinking about as we go through the summer, is that the plants that grow fastest, buttonwood is one of them. Um, strangler figs actually grow really fast. Um, grasses, there's a there's a whole host of things that are that are cocoa plums, if you have any cocoa plums left. Um, all of the fast growers are going to bounce back from the storm relatively quickly, assuming they made it. Um, they're going to spit out leaves faster. They're going to start to recuperate faster. They're going to respond to the rain faster. Um, the things that are a little bit slower growing, so some of our stoppers, um, Mersine, um, there's a whole bunch of different ones that are on the slower growing side, they might still be kind of building up their energy reserves and kind of getting their act back together to be alive. Hopefully they are alive. But you're not going to see, it's like what I was talking about in those pictures that I showed of the mangroves. They are going to be slower to respond and to bounce back than the faster growing things. Um, so I think really what you're seeing with the buttonwoods is just that they are a fast um, grower. And some of the other plants are just going to take longer to really kind of come around. And so it's going to be a little bit of a waiting game and a little bit of um, requiring a little bit of patience. But um, by the end of summer, we should start to see some, you know, some greening of some things that are on the slower side for sure. So are there any more? Oh, a couple more questions for L. All right. So, um, all right. What materials would be resistant to water for interiors? This is actually a little bit tricky. Um, there, for interiors, it becomes harder and it becomes more about how do you make sure that the water can get back out and how do you make sure that the 
the materials themselves can air out and dry. So you're not sitting with water in there. Many of the building materials are actually designed so that they can take a little bit of water, take a little bit of moisture, um, and then dry out. So when we design our walls, the wall assembly, like all of the studs and insulation and drywall and all of these things, it's done in a way that air can vent in and out. And in doing that, it allows for us to avoid um, uh, moisture buildup and mold. So that's already a part of the way that we build. Um, that doesn't mean that if you installed, um, I don't know, something, a, a wood floor or carpet that they got too inundated or inundated by water that you're not going to have to replace some things or a lot of things. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of the interior building materials aren't quite made for um, for that, but that's where we are. So I think you want to work with your architect and work with your contractor to make sure things can really air out and dry and try to choose materials that are maybe a little bit better at um, doing that. Um, all right, do you recommend having a sealed non-vented space? Whoops, just moving around with insulation in the rafters. Um, you know, this is a big building technology debate. Do you vent um, at the attic? Do you not vent at the attic and seal it? And actually, um, there are also hybrid situations for this. And so it'll vary very much based on the kind of building geometry and the way that your roof is. Um, so certainly talk to your contractor, talk to an architect uh, about which um, version is going to be better for you. But in terms of allowing for the climatized air, so the air conditioning to kind of stay in there, you're going to want to seal it up very well. You might need to, if it is a perfect seal, then that means that ventilation is more difficult if you have all the windows closed. And so you can actually have um, a mechanical ventilation system that allows for fresh air to come in and go out again. Um, so there are a lot of ways to, to answer that question, but certainly it's a good question to be asking and for something for everyone to really be aware of the venting or non-venting of the space. Um, all right. So uh, what can you do for your roof if you want to avoid getting hot by staying cool? So the color is a really big thing use a light roof. That's the simplest thing I can really say about that. So try to go for that metal roof in a light color, like the light aluminum, white, light gray, and that's going to make a huge difference on your temperature loads um, in the building. Um, you can also think about the orientations of your building, if it's south facing versus north facing, um, how do you do the angles of the roof so it's it's deflecting heat in a better way or doing self-shading the roof if it extends a little bit, not too much to allow for too much lift off from wind, high wind events, but a, enough that you can get a little bit of self-shading that will also help um, your building uh, stay cool. Um, all right, I think that there are some questions for you now. Yeah, and I think we probably got time for a couple more for each of us. Um, I am going to just address someone asked if um, we'll be sending out a link to pass along to friends and neighbors. And yes, we did record this. Um, we will be posting it in a day or two on our YouTube channel, but we will likely also send it out in our e-news. So feel free to share, like I said, with friends and neighbors. Um, okay. We have buttonwood sprouts coming up. How easily do they transplant? Um, they transplant very easily. Um, with that in mind, uh, keep in mind the city the city ordinance that if a plant is over six feet or greater than two inches in diameter, you would need a permit to move it or remove it. Um, but if they're just little itty bitty things, um, I would say water them first and then they transplant really easily. Um, when you do transplant them, uh, you have to treat them like they're newly planted plants. So they will need watered um, until they're established. So um, how is SCCF going to replant its conservation lands? Um, I am not the land manager, um, so I can't entirely answer that question, but I can say that there is a tremendous seed source from just our native vegetation that's been out there for you know eons at this point. Um, so my inclination is that it's going to come back on its own. Um, I don't think that they're short of some areas that got really, really, really damaged. Um, a lot of it is going to come back um, in its own due time. And that's, 
unfortunately the best answer I can give for you right now because I don't know the ins and outs not being our, our on our land management staff. Um, the next question is about, do you have a view for about bamboo for screening? Um, I, there's nothing wrong with bamboo as long as it's not the running invasive bamboo um, with the exception of um, the idea that it really gives basically nothing to wildlife. Um, so I think there are probably some other choices. It's not that you have to be purist in your landscape, um, maybe a bamboo here and there for an accent. Um, but if you are looking at supporting wildlife in your landscape, um, bamboo is not going to really do much for you there. Um, so, And then um, there are some more questions for L. and then um, let me get through these. And then we might be out of time. We'll just see how they go. Great. Yes, I've been kind of typing in answers um, for specific questions. So hopefully those of you have gotten your answers for that. These two are about solar. They're great questions. So solar is unique in that it actually wants to attract the sunlight and attract the heat in order to create efficiency. So the fact that it's dark, yes, maybe um, that's not as great for a roof that doesn't have the solar um, capability, but for solar, you, you you are trying to attract that um, the sunlight to take on the energy. So it's going to be dark color, and that's what it's going to be. Um, but it, it is a great investment to go solar. I definitely think that that's a good idea. All right. I think that that is it for that. Thank you. Uh oh, Jenny, you're muted. Sorry, I realized I was muted. Um, I think that takes care of everything um, and all the questions that we at least had at this point. So again, if anyone has more questions, feel free to reach out to us. I want to thank all of you for joining us and I wanna give a huge thanks um, to Elle for providing all of this amazing information and spending her time with us. And of course, working on our intern housing, which we are super excited about. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Um, look for the recording in a bit and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye.